All right, we still have people jumping on. We'll wait another, another minute or so, and then we'll get started. All right, it's 12.01, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Laura Smith. I'm a program manager at TAPI, and we are so happy everybody's here to join us, and we hope you can learn something that will help you in your job. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in public health, and I'm also a certified health education specialist. I am the mom of several children, and I'm very passionate about public health and preventing disease, um, diseases through vaccination. So um, I'm excited for this training today. With me, I have um, Wendy O'Donnell. Um, she'll be helping me present today. And Wendy, I would love for you to introduce yourself. Hello, um, as Laura said, I'm Wendy O'Donnell and um, my background is in health education. Um, I have a master's degree in public health and I'm a master certified health education specialist, which is a mouthful. Um, and I'm also a mom. I have three kids. Um, the youngest just turned one last weekend. So that was a, a exciting time for us. Um, and I've, yeah, my background has been in um, immunization education and as Laura is as well, I'm super um, passionate about vaccines and the positive impact that um, it brings, they bring to a community. Awesome. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, so let's get going here. Um, just some record or, you know, housekeeping things. Please keep your microphone or phone on mute unless you are speaking please use the chat box to ask any questions you may have. We may have some time to address them um, as they come up or later on in the training, you may see that we're gonna talk about them anyway. So um, write in all your questions. We have Denise on the chat box today with Tappy and she is very knowledgeable and willing to um, answer all your, all your questions as you chat them in. So please do that. If you have any issues, just um, send us a message that, to the administrator if you're having any difficulties. And the most important thing is that all the handouts, the videos, the links, everything that you see today will be um, accessible to you through our website, as well as a recording from today. So if you have a coworker that you think would benefit from the training, um, they can watch the video of it. And, um, and if there's a handout or, you know, infographic you see today, we definitely will, you'll have access to all of that on our website. So let's get going. Um, the objectives of this training are to discuss 10 science-centered, evidence-based concepts about why parents should vaccinate their children. We're going to answer common questions um, and address any misconceptions you may have heard. And we're gonna teach you how to distinguish myths um, facts from myths and let you know like how to feel a little more comfortable talking to people about vaccines. So today we have a lot of social workers, um, some teachers, health educators, vaccine specialists, some medical assistants, and we even have some medical students with us today. So that is all um, very exciting to have so many people with us and different backgrounds, but this training will really help you all um, in your jobs to learn how to talk to parents about the decision to vaccinate their children and give them the confidence to do that. We will have some quizzes throughout the presentation. So um, at that time, you'll put your answers in the chat box and try to win a prize. So the chat box will be your friend today. I want to show you a quick video about some things we have learned through vaccination. So let's see here. I want to tell you about a time, time in American history so, so that it, it never repeats so itself. So it never repeats itself. It was a harrowing time. A heart-wrenching time. I could hear my mother warn me. Seal, don't go out and play. 
My family was ravaged. Thousands and thousands died. I was scared. So scared. And then one day... And then one day... And then one day, there was hope. Before vaccines, there were few ways to help protect against deadly illnesses. Diseases like measles, meningitis, diphtheria, hib, whooping cough, or polio, which killed my grandma's youngest son. Without vaccines, these threats can reemerge. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here to tell my children to help protect their children. Get your kids vaccinated and keep them on schedule. I never want my grandchildren to see what I saw. The real dilemma that we have to face is that because of the effectiveness of vaccines over the past 50 to 75 years, many people have forgotten about the diseases those vaccines were developed to fight. So this phenomenon is called vaccine amnesia or public health amnesia, where a public health initiative such as vaccination makes something, it becomes so successful that people forget that those diseases even exist. They forget about polio and all the ones mentioned in the video. And then um, we can start to see things like measles cases start to pop up more and more across the country. So we're talking about 10 things today. And so number one on our list is kids are at risk for disease. This map shows exactly what we're talking about with that public health amnesia. Measles was thought to be eradicated in, two, in the year 2000, but in 2014, new cases started popping up in unvaccinated communities. And then still five years later on this chart, we see that um, in 2019, all of the states in dark blue reported at least one case of measles. And in 2022, we're seeing even more than that. So if you really look and count the states, there were 28 states that experienced at least one measles case. And that's more than half from a disease that we thought had been eradicated through vaccination. So the problem persists and these outbreaks are a direct effect of lower rates of immunization. And that shows that even when you haven't seen a single case of a disease in 14 years, it doesn't mean that it has actually gone away completely. Um, continued immunization is the only way to prevent these diseases long-term. We also have seen that pertussis or whooping cough is now beginning to recirculate. Um, and then Arizona kids, you can see the Arizona map here. Arizona kids are especially at risk. ADHS, our state health department, required every school to report, requires every school to report once a year on the coverage levels of kids enrolled in schools. And this information is made available um, to the public and parents can be informed about coverage levels. Our schools used to be at the 95% coverage rate but over the last five to six years, the level of protection has begun to drop as we see a lot more vaccine exemptions um, increase. So some schools are even down to 40% coverage and Arizona has been identified as a hotspot um, because of low coverage levels. Number two, vaccine preventable diseases still exist. Um, the data shows that the diseases still exist and are circulating. However, if you have never experienced some of these, these diseases, you can fall into the trap of, of believing that they don't really exist or that they'll probably never touch you personally. So we're going to watch a video um, about a little baby who was exposed to pertussis or whooping cough. And it is a terrible video to watch because it is so sad to see this baby struggle um, to breathe. But I think it's really important that we understand the diseases that we're trying to prevent through vaccination. So it's a little uncomfortable to watch. It is about two minutes, but it makes a really big um, impact about how important vaccines are. Okay. 
Hey, take a bath here, honey. Come on. Almost there. There we go. Okay, hopefully you all made it through. It makes me very uncomfortable and squirm even watching that movie. Um, I do have a little baby and so I just feel it's terrible to watch that video of, of that baby struggling to breathe. So um, number three, outbreaks are preventable when parents make the decision to vaccinate. So the way we have tra traditionally prevented outbreaks was to keep a 95% of the population immunized against these diseases. So if 95% of the people have immunity, the disease cannot spread throughout the community. It's also important that our youngest kids are immunized before they enter school so they can protect the community around them. <clears throat> this is referred to as herd immunity, or community immunity. You may have heard that before. So we're attempting to keep our communities healthy and the best way to do that is to vaccinate. Um, it's easiest to think about the community in terms of a fence. So if you think about those of us with immunizations, we are the planks of the fence. And if to get, and together, if enough of us are immunized, it provides protection around those who are not immunized. So uh, maybe they're too young or medically they cannot be immunized, but they're protect protected by the 95% of us who are. When a disease comes up, it will hit the fence and those immunized will not get sick or be able to spread the disease. So then we protect the under immunized. Outbreaks happen when there are too many holes in the fence and then a disease just floats right through like that 40% um, in the school I was talking about earlier. Once it infects, once a disease infects a unimmunized person, it puts all the other unimmunized people at risk. So it's really important that we keep the concept of community immunity on our mind. Number four, we know that vaccines work. Um, we want to make sure that you have the hard evidence that vaccines work. So once we have a vaccine against a disease, that means we've been able to eradicate, eliminate, or decrease the number of cases to almost zero after the vaccine has been introduced. So you can see here, looking at this chart, we have smallpox here. It decreased 100% in 1980. Tetanus decreased 100%, kind of goes all the way through. All of these ones that may sound a little familiar if you have um, your vaccine record, or if you have um, younger kids, they have gotten immunized over, you know, against all of these diseases. Um, vaccines are researched, monitored, and followed in the community. They're tested and then updated. The vaccines that we use today are not the same ones that were originally developed. So once a vaccine is approved for use, 
It is still constantly tested and researched for safety and efficiency um, and then updated if needed. These diseases go away because vaccines work. According to the CDC, vaccines save an estimated 42,000 lives every year, which is three times more, seat, more than seatbelts and child restraints combined. So if you think about that for a minute, choosing not to vaccinate your child is like putting them in the car with no seatbelt or child restraint. I would never put my one-year-old baby in a, in a car and start driving without putting her all the way buckled up in her car seat. Um, you know, most of the time it'll probably be fine if, because how often do you uh, get into a car accident? Very rarely, maybe you're only driving two miles, but it only takes one single incident for a seatbelt or child restraint to be worthwhile in saving your child's life. And then in turn, it only takes a single exposure to a disease that you can't see for your child to become ill with one of these diseases. And the long-term effects on their health can be serious. That is if they even survive. So we wanna make sure that we um, encourage people to choose to vaccinate their children. All right, number five, vaccines offer protection to us, sometimes in different ways. Um, so vaccines protect us from getting the actual disease, but newborns who are too young to get vaccinated are first protected by their mother's vaccines. This is the first round of protection, but it does begin to wear off around two months of age. This is why there's a schedule, a vaccine schedule that starts when the baby is two months old to continue the protection. Now, there are some people who cannot get vaccines. They're too sick, medically compromised. They may have allergies. And these people are protected by those around them getting vaccinated, just like in our fence analogy a few slides ago. <clears throat> and then just as a side note, I think you should know that only approximately one um, child in a million have a true allergic reaction to a vaccine. They are safe, they are tested, and they're um, constantly monitored to make sure that they continue to be that way. Sometimes people can get swelling or a rash or start to feel sick and think that's an allergic reaction, but a true allergic reaction is severe and incredibly rare. The CDC has researched the best time to give vaccines to offer the maximum benefit, so we should really follow the um, immunization schedule and make sure we're getting vaccines at the correct time. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. She's going to take you through the next part of the training. Thanks, Laura. Um, so number six, um, vaccines act as our personal ninja to protect from the actual disease. Um, so um, the ninja goes in um, as the vaccine and identifies when there is a potential um, exposure and make sure, make sure to get rid of those, those germs. Um, you hear people talk a lot about like, oh, well, when I was little, we only had to get a few vaccines and we're giving our kids too many these these days. Um, but it's really interesting to see that even though um, we are protect, we're protected against more uh, vaccine preventable diseases with fewer antigens. So 30 years ago, vaccines used 3000 antigens to protect against eight diseases by the age of two. Um, and today, there's that 3,000 antigens has gone down to 305, and it protects against 14 diseases, so almost, almost double by the age of two. Next slide. Okay, so we have some fun quizzes, and um, Tapia loves giving out prizes, so um, we're just going to chat this, uh, enter your answer in the, the chat. Um, what vaccine is recommended during pregnancy? Is it A, pertussis or Tdap, B, flu, C, COVID, D, B, and C, or E, all of the above? We'll just give you a minute to throw it in there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, great. It looks like we're seeing a lot of a lot of E's. Um, e is the correct answer. I think um, Denise mentioned Megan Ray was first, so you will be getting a prize. I believe Denise will be in contact with you to uh, arrange that. Um, and yes, it is E. It's all of the above. Um, pertussis and flu were the regular um, vaccines for pregnancy before COVID was around. And now that COVID is around um, and we have protection against it, it is also recommended to for um, a woman to receive during each pregnancy. And that leads us right into our, our next slide. Uh, babies get their first vaccine from mom. So as uh, Laura mentioned earlier, some immunity, some protection is spread to um, newborns right when they are born. And then that protection starts to wane around two months. Um, one of the ways that we can increase the protection is to get mom vaccinated against pertussis and flu um, so that when the baby is born, some of that protection is spread um, is transferred to the baby. And now that we do have the COVID vaccine, um, it is also recommended to get during pregnancy. And um, you can get it at the same time as you get any of the other vaccines. That's something that, um, you know, so when you go in for, for your flu vaccine, if it's flu season, um, you, you are also able to get the, the COVID-19 vaccine, um, either the primary series or the booster or wherever you are in it, um, you are able to do that. And that will give your baby some protection. There have been studies that show um, that newborns that have some circulating antibodies when they are born um, if their mom has gotten um, vaccinated during pregnancy, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, I was lucky, well, I was pregnant with my son during when the, the vaccine was first um, announced, uh, released, available. <laughs> um, so I was able to get it while I was pregnant and I was super, super happy and had um, a lot more peace of mind knowing that he had a little bit of protection um, and hopefully still does before he's old enough to get the vaccine himself. And your best defense against the flu um, is the flu shot. We we know this from, from years and years and years of, of studying. Um, washing your hands is great and we definitely wanna do that. We know um, since COVID, there's been a lot of talk about physical distancing and kind of keeping your space and all of these things are wonderful ways to prevent disease, but the best way to do that is to get the, the vaccine. Oh, okay. Shoot. <laughs> Can you get the flu vaccine and COVID vaccine in the same visit? Yes, no, or not sure. I kind of I kind of gave you guys the answer on that one. <laughs> and the answer is yes. Yes. So I know Denise is monitoring that. So we will get in, in um contact with the person who um, answered that correctly first. Um, so yes, it, it, you were, oh, sorry. I was just going to say you're, you're able, you're able to get those at the same time. So you don't have to wait. You don't have to keep any, um, you don't have to make a separate appointment. You're able to get them both at the same time. And it's definitely a good idea to do that. If, um, you know, if you are going for your flu vaccine and you've not gotten your COVID vaccine or your booster, wherever you are in the series, um, you can do that at the same time very convenient. Number eight is that doctors and science support vaccination. Um, this is the biggest indicator of whether someone will get vaccinated or not is if their doctor recommends it. And all of the major um, um, professional organizations in the U.S. Um, support vaccination. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, American Nurses Association, Centers for Disease, Disease Control and Prevention, and March of Dines all strongly support um, children, protecting children with recommended vaccinations. And then this is a, a good one to um, touch on now, even though school just got out, it's it'll be a very short time before kids are going back to school. Um, and there are certain vaccines that are that are uh, required for school um, participation um, to as Laura mentioned earlier, it's really to keep the the community protected to keep 
to keep those kids who maybe can't get it because they're immunocompromised, um, to keep them protected and, and healthy. Um, there's, you will see something, you will notice a difference between recommended vaccines and required vaccines. Required vaccines are what the state, um, the, the state legislature makes a decision on. The recommended vaccines is what the CDC says this is the best way to keep kids protected. So you almost think that required means it's more important, um, but that's just what's required and that's just what lawmakers voted on to have included for kids to be able to attend public school, well, schools. Um, so don't let the term recommended versus required um, throw you off. Uh, we wanna go with the, the CDC recommended schedule for whatever age the child is. And then number 10, kids still need protection as they grow. Um, the CDC's recommended immunization schedule will help protect your child throughout their lifetime. Um, so of course we know for childcare, preschool, um, elementary school, middle school, high school, these are all times that you know that you have to make sure that your kid's up to date, but then it's also, you know, into college and as adults, um, you know, there's certain um, vaccines that, that we need to keep up with as adults as well. Okay, so we have a great video um, that talks about why vaccines work. It's a little bit long, about seven minutes, but it really gives you a great understanding and foundation of why vaccines work. So if you have any questions, kind of think about what questions you may have, put them in the chat, and then we will go through um, some common questions that you may be hearing as you interact with um, parents of young children. Um, and so you can chat them in and then we'll go through and talk about some of them. Aren't you glad you don't have scurvy? In 1747, in the first medical trial ever performed, Scottish physician James Lynn found out that eating citrus fruits could cure scurvy. Now, today we know this works because citrus contains high levels of vitamin C. In fact, ascorbic acid, a common name for vitamin C, comes from the Latin for not scurvy. By issuing rations of lemon juice to sailors, the British Navy was able to pretty much eliminate the disease until the late 1800s, when polar explorers suddenly began to see scurvy again. The copper pots holding their lime juice had destroyed the vitamin C, but they were pretty confused. So despite James Lynn's experiments 150 years before, citrus fruits became the enemy. And when Robert Falcon Scott set out to reach the South Pole in 1911, he carried the finest in canned meat products, biscuits, chocolate, tea, and zero vitamin C. A Norwegian team beat them to the pole by five weeks, and during their sad journey home, Scott and his team perished in a blizzard, sick and weak from what was probably scurvy. It had been so long since anyone had seen this disease, the British had forgotten how to prevent it. When we create such effective solutions, we can forget how serious the problems were. Thankfully, people today don't die of scurvy or polio. Since the introduction of Jonas Salk's polio vaccine in 1955, the disease has been nearly eradicated from the earth. The thing to remember is that this is a continuous process. Compare the 358 infections reported in 2014 to the 1940s, when half a million people per year were paralyzed or died from polio infections. Vaccines work. Our immune system is on constant alert against germy baddies with millions of white blood cells each on the lookout for specific infections. When an immune cell meets its target, it replicates itself and this clone army sends a barrage of protein weapons called antibodies to label the trash for cleanup. And after the infection is gone, so-called memory cells stick around, ready to mount a fast attack in case this germ shows up again. This is how we develop immunity and it works pretty well, you know, since we're all still alive. But even with all that, some super bad germs can take us out before our immune centuries have had time to call up their clone army. This is especially true for young children. Their immune systems are fresh out of basic training. Thankfully, we have vaccines, which are made of tiny pieces or weakened versions of viruses or bacteria. They let our immune system see what the bad guys look like 
and recruit those all-important memory cells before we ever have to actually see the real enemy. Thanks to vaccines, the US was able to eliminate measles in the year 2000. But in recent years, as more and more parents are refusing to vaccinate their children or are vaccinating them later than what doctors recommend, it's back. In most states, more than 90% of children are vaccinated, but that's not enough to keep a disease like measles at bay. In our episode about Ebola, we talked about a number called r naught, the basic reproduction number for a disease, or the number of people infected by one person in a susceptible population. For Ebola, that number is low, but for measles, each sick person will infect up to 18 others. But luckily, vaccines can change that. The fraction of people who are vaccinated or immune can lower the reproduction number below one, which means the disease is disappearing. 90% of unprotected people who come in contact with somebody who has measles, even just breathing the same air, will become infected. To control a super contagious virus like that, the vaccination rate has to be 95% or above. And right now the US is lagging behind and measles is making a comeback. The Guardian put together a simulation of just how this so-called herd immunity works. When enough of a population is vaccinated, even if it's not 100%, the herd can protect the unprotected. With vaccine refusal on the rise, our herd immunity is breaking down. Preventable diseases like measles and whooping cough have become our scurvy. Most of us don't know anyone with polio, and I mean, measles, it's not that bad, right? Well, yes, it is that bad. Before the age of vaccines, millions of people were killed by diseases that today are just bad memories. Vaccines have let us develop a sort of generational amnesia. Today, we expect our children to grow up healthy, and we're lucky that we don't appreciate just how dangerous these diseases are. Like science writer Seth Mnookin says, vaccines are victims of their own success. Because of stories like Andrew Wakefield's discredited study wrongly linking vaccines and autism, and the news media's obsession with pictures of crying, terrified children being poked with needles, people are nervous about vaccines. This anxiety isn't new, though. When Edward Jenner in 1798 saw that milkmaids didn't catch smallpox, well, he realized that because they'd been exposed to the similar cowpox disease, they were immune. And based on this, he developed an early smallpox vaccine by inoculating humans with the cow virus. In fact, the word vaccine itself has bovine origins. Still, as far back as 1802, critics were claiming that the smallpox inoculation would turn you into a cow. Vaccines don't come without risk. Nothing does. But on average, fewer than one in a million people will experience a dangerous reaction to common vaccines. And car accidents, playing outside, even walking will injure more children. Vaccines are asking us to do something altruistic, to make a choice to protect not only ourselves and our children, but also those around us. Author Eula Biss says that vaccines are one of the most empathetic things that we can do. A system that's based on people voluntarily using their bodies to protect other vulnerable people. And that's something I hope we don't forget. Now, I'm a doctor, but I'm not that kind of doctor. It's natural to have questions about vaccines, and you should have a conversation with your medical professional. They want the best for you and yours. I will give you one prescription, though, and that's to subscribe, so you can get a full dose of science every week. And <clears throat> all right, well, hopefully we all learned something. Um, I think he does such a great job of explaining um, how vaccines work and why they're important. So I know the number, I said we would, we would go through some questions, and I know the number one question that most people have right now during this stream. And if you want to read some amazing, sorry, is um, what about COVID vaccines? So Wendy, she's going to talk us through um, COVID vaccines, vaccines for kids, all of that. So go ahead, Wendy. Thanks. So um, one first thing we want to say about the COVID-19 vaccine is that uh, the safety has been a top priority from the beginning. Um, full safety trials were done on each vaccine and then ongoing monitoring continues. So it's not just a, okay, it's done, we did it, let's move on to something else. Um, they continue to monitor side effects, um, they continue to monitor the safety. 
we do have a vaccine available. Hopefully this is um, common knowledge to all of you. Um, the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine is recommended for children five and older. Um, and also they, the new recommendation is that um, children five and older are eligible for a booster um, about five months after they finish their primary series. So this um, is really um, a good way, especially before the summer, before they start school again, get your kids boosted so that they can have um, that higher protection when they are around more, more kids. Um, right now, safety trials are being reviewed for kids under age five, and we are hoping that that recommendation will be, will be announced later this month. Um, and it's likely to be a three dose series for kids under the age of five, just because they are seeing um, higher efficacy with the initial three doses. Um, and, and, and just as with pregnancy, um, children might need other vaccines at the same time that they that they need the COVID-19 vaccine or COVID-19 um, booster. Um, and it's completely safe for them to get all other recommended uh, childhood vaccines at the same time. So while you're doing that, talk to your healthcare provider about the other vaccines that might be needed. Um, we did see that there was a bit of a lag um, and a hesitation for, for families to go to the doctor during the uh, COVID, um, during the height of it, when, when we didn't have vaccine, when there was no protection, um, and people were just trying to keep their family safe. So some a lot of kids have fallen behind on their recommended vaccines because they miss well child um, visits, which is completely understandable. So now is a great time to talk to your provider and get them caught up on what they're missing. So they can help you do that. Um, we, we talked about this again, but it, it cannot be overstated. Um, vaccinated kids protect other kids in the classroom. They protect their friends. They protect the community. Um, they protect family. It's, it's really a, a very important, um, they play a very important role in protecting the community. Um, another uh, highlight is that um, kids don't have to quarantine if they have been vaccinated. So that's less time out of school, which of course now that um, most schools are out in Arizona, it's not a um, it's not a concern at the moment. But for summer camps, for things like that, that there, there's also some restrictions that are that are going to happen there. Uh, but the, the most important thing about the COVID-19 vaccine is that it will allow us to get back to normal. Um, kids will be able to go to birthday parties and um, hang out with their friends and do other activities that they that we used to do without even thinking about. Um, the COVID-19 and vaccine in kids over the age of five. Um, this is a little bit about the side effects. Um, younger children actually may experience fewer side effects than adolescents or young adults. Um, my, I took my six-year-old to get it as soon as it was um, um, recommended and she was completely fine. That's like, you wouldn't have known. Um, she, she did it and and the next day she had zero side effects. Um, some, some, there are side effects can be expected though. Um, pain at the injection site, swelling, um, some have a fever, fatigue, headache, chills. Those are things that are pretty common with any vaccine. Um, and again, as we mentioned before, kids can get the COVID-19 vaccine at the same time as any other childhood vaccine. So one thing we we also hear is that, oh, well, it's not that serious for kids. Why do we need to get them the vaccine? Um, besides, besides the whole community protection that we've already talked about is that there have been 13.4 million cases in children in the U.S. since the beginning of the pandemic um, and 1,257 deaths. Um, I think even one death is, is too many. Um, and that's, so that's, that's really, really sad, especially now that we do have a vaccine that can help um, protect the all of the kids. You want me to talk about this one for a second, Wendy? Sure. 
So Chappie has developed a COVID vaccine finder to make it very easy anywhere in Arizona to find where you can get a COVID vaccine. Um, it is our website. And Denise, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. Um, but so you just put in your address or your work address or wherever, you, you know, your school address, wherever you are. Um, and then it pulls up a list of any vaccine providers in that area for COVID vaccines. Um, and then it also shows what ages they have vaccine available for. So not every single location has a vaccine for ages 5 to 12 but it does show that on the vaccine finder, as well as if <clears throat> um, the provider speaks um, Spanish, English, um, and then what uh, types, what manufacturers are available. Um, so if you're looking specifically for a Moderna vaccine, um, then you can figure out where that is. So I have used it many times. I just realized it has been over five months since my eight and 10 year old uh, finish their vaccine, uh, their COVID vaccine doses. And so it is time for them to get vaccinated. So I entered in my address and I pulled up the locations near me and I could see exactly which location has that vaccine available. So we're doing that today. And, um, and then they'll be boosted before we go on to our family reunion and before school starts again. So, um, so yeah, it's a great it's a great tool, and you can use it with your parents and patients and anyone that you work with. And then, um, Wendy, do you want to go through? We have a few common concerns that that people have um, said, and we'll kind of talk through them because you may have heard some of these things. Um, so we want to make sure you have helpful information for this. So when the the COVID nineteen vaccine was um, first recommended for the for the five plus um, age range, we heard a lot about um, myocarditis or peri pericarditis. Um, and basically that's just the swelling around the heart. Um, and they were saying that those who, what, what was said was those who had the COVID-19 vaccine had a higher risk of myocarditis. Um, than those who didn't get the vaccine. Um, and what we want to um, clarify is that the risk of getting myocarditis is higher when with active COVID-19 infection. So those who have um, gotten sick from COVID-19 have a higher risk of getting myocard myocarditis than those who get vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything, so I'm just going to read off the, the little bullets. Um, the risk of myocarditis or pericarditis after getting an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine is lower than the risk of myocarditis associated with um, the COVID-19 infection in adolescents and adults. Um, and it has occurred rarely in some people following the, the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine and it would typically be within the first um, few days after the second dose. And these cases that we're talking about, it's 2.5 cases per 1 million. Um, and it seemed to be a little bit higher in males aged 12 to 29. And a lot of them, most, most were quickly resolved with an anti-inflammatory. Um, the vaccine given to kids under 12 is a smaller dose and has been less, um, less reactive. Um, it's somewhat common as a result of a viral infection. So that's why um, after a viral COVID-19 um, infection, it's, you're more likely to, um, you're more likely to, to have myocarditis after an active viral infection like COVID-19. Um, typically it's about 100 to 200 cases per million people per year. So you can see that when you do um, compare 2.5 cases to a million from 100 to 200 cases, you're better off getting the COVID-19 vaccine and preventing COVID-19 in the first place than um, having active infection and possibly um, um, developing myo myocarditis. And then another um, 
Another concern we hear is about puberty or fer fertility in children. Um, and these are not true and they are unfounded. Um, their their COVID-19 vaccine does not affect puberty or fertility. Um, MR mRNA vaccines are processed near the injection site and activated immune system cells travel through the lymph system to nearby lymph nodes. Uh, they're not affecting hormone levels, nor are they traveling throughout the body or other parts of the body. Um, there's no, not a biological reason to expect that maturation or re reproductive functionality would be negatively affected by COVID-19 vaccine um, now or in future years. Um, so I think we're going to watch this short video about this, and this will maybe answer it a little bit clearer. Hi, my name is Paul Offit. It is Tuesday, May 4th, 2021, and I'm talking to you at the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, one question that has come up regarding COVID-19 vaccines, especially among young women of childbearing age, is, is it possible that this vaccine or these vaccines could affect fertility, could affect my ability to get pregnant? The answer in short is no, and let me explain why and where this whole false notion came from. This false notion was born of this, the, the, this uh, um, letter that was actually written to the European Medicines Agency, which is like the European equivalent of the Food and Drug Administration, claiming that there was similarity between the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which is what you're making an antibody response to when you get these vaccines, and a protein that sits on the surface of placental cells called syncytial, syncytion 1. So the thinking was, if you're making an antibody response to that spike protein of coronavirus, you're also inadvertently making an antibody response to this syncytion 1 protein on the surface of placental cells, which would then affect uh, fertility. First of all, that wasn't true. Those two proteins are very different. It's like saying you and I both have the same social security number because they both contain the number 5. So that was wrong to begin with. Plus, you can argue there's two strong pieces of evidence that argue against it. One is that there was two prospective placebo control trials done before submission for emergency use authorization from both Pfizer and Moderna. During those two trials, 36 women roughly became pregnant. Um, now, if it was true that this vaccine or these vaccines affected fertility, then there should have been more pregnancies in the placebo group than in the vaccine group, but that wasn't true. There were really 18 instances of pregnancy in the, in the vaccine group and 18 instances of pregnancy in the placebo group. So therefore, the vaccine didn't enhance fertility and it didn't negatively affect fertility. Also, if you're arguing that antibodies are directed against the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein would affect placental cells, remember that about 100 million people have been infected with this virus over the past year and a half. Um, during that time, um, they have been making antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So if it's true that that would affect fertility, then the question is what's happened to the fertility rate or the birth rate in this country, say between 2019 and 2020? If it was affecting fertility, if natural infection was affecting fertility, then birth rates should have gone down. But that's not what happened. Birth rates have actually gone up slightly. So those are two pieces of evidence that argue against this, this vaccine or natural infection in any sense affecting fertility. Thank you. So that was the first of many um, videos that we have with Dr. Offit. He's um, a really wonderful um, educator, has a, a huge program. Um, he's from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So you'll see him more, um, but he does a really good job explaining it. That was very scientific, <laughs> but I think it's, it's interesting to hear um, why why that's unfounded and why that this this can't happen and how we know that for sure um so another concern is is it safe to get the vaccine while pregnant or breastfeeding um i kind of touched on this earlier um it's recommended for all people five years and older um, including people who are pregnant breastfeeding trying to get pregnant now or might want to become pregnant later um Pregnant and recently pregnant people are more likely to get severely ill with COVID-19 compared with non-pregnant people. And the risk of stillbirth in pregnant 
stillbirth in pregnant people with COVID-19 almost doubles. So um, COVID-19 can be very harmful to the woman and her unborn child um, if she is infected during pregnancy. Um, evidence about the safety and effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine during pregnancy has been growing. Um, more women are pregnant and getting vaccinated, and we're seeing that there is no um, um, harmful side effects from the vaccine. Um, getting a COVID-19 vaccine can protect you from severe illness from COVID-19 and may provide some immunity for your baby. So I kind of talked about that earlier as well. Um, I have kind of an interesting uh, little story. This is anecdotal, so take take it um, how you will. But um, I have been lucky enough to overproduce breast milk for my son. So I have been donating it to a friend who um, has foster twins. Um, and they were born about three, three weeks after my son. So they're almost the same age. So um, I've been donating it. She's been supplementing. Um, what's, what's really kind of interesting is she had COVID-19 run through her house. So her and her partner were, um, got sick. Her um, other two daughters got sick. So all um, four, four of the six were um were down with COVID-19. But the babies that were on my breast milk um did not. So it's very interesting. I mean, like I said, take 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 that how however you feel, but um I feel very proud to have possibly contributed to protecting those little babies while everyone else was sick. Um, there's also a great res resource if you um, are pregnant and have questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, Mother to Baby is a great contact. So you can email and live chat and the information is on this slide. So we do have this um, vaccine card on our website that you can pass it out like as a flyer. Um, it shows where you can get a vaccine and make an appointment, all of that. Um, if you are someone who is working with parents of young children, it's really important that you yourself are vaccinated. You don't want to be spreading that to your clients or your patients. Um, the COVID-19 vaccine is widely available now. And so you can contact your county health department for locations. You can use our TAPI vaccine finder. But it's really important that you yourself get vaccinated and then encourage those that you work with to also. Okay, so <clears throat> Denise, how are we doing in the chat? Do we have any questions that you'd like us to address? Um, and then we have some ready al already. We've the got box. most of them addressed, but okay. everyone's welcome to keep putting them in and I can also pass them to our panelists. Okay, perfect. So yes, if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat. And then let's just go through some of the questions that we've heard in the past. Um, let's see. So the first one, um, it's kind of set up like a scenario and then we kind of role play what you would do and, and how to kind of answer the question and talk through it. And then there's a short video that um, typically from Dr. Offit that will kind of explain it a little more detailed. So for the first one, a couple you are friends with tell you that they worry um, newer vaccines are not safe. They worry that the pharmaceutical companies make vaccines without testing them before they are given to kids and adults. So what resources do you have available to help them with their concerns? And what would you say? Um, feel free to chat it into the box how you would answer this question and maybe we can kind of learn from each other. So you can say a few different things. Um, before a new vaccine is ever given to people, there is extensive lab testing done that can take several years. We saw with the COVID-19 vaccine, because of many different reasons, they were able to accelerate that. Extra money was given, companies worked together to do their safety testing, and it was really a miracle how quickly they were able to offer the COVID vaccine to everybody. Um, the FDA sets rules for the three phases of clinical trials. Maybe that sounds familiar to you guys. Um, 
because they want to ensure that the safety um, to ensure the safety of the volunteers. Researchers test vaccines with adults first and then onto kids. That's why the kids have not, the youngest kids have not um, been able to get a COVID-19 vaccine. First it came to adults, then the teenagers, and then um, five to 12. The FDA and CDC closely monitor vaccine safety after the public begins using the vaccine, and they watch for any side effects, adverse events, and monitoring a vaccine after, after it's licensed helps ensure that any risks associated with the vaccine are identified. Um, we have a great little video here, and it's kind of a lot of information, but it's really important that you all have a good basis of um, understanding of how vaccines are developed, improved, and, and manufactured, because you'll get kind of all kinds of these questions. The journey of your child's vaccine. A vaccine must be safe and effective. How a new vaccine is developed, approved, and manufactured. Vaccines begin the journey in the laboratory where scientists work to figure out how best to protect against dangerous germs. Before a new vaccine is made available to the public, researchers usually must do years of lab tests on the vaccine. If lab results look promising, and the vaccine appears to be both safe and effective, volunteers will be enrolled to get the vaccines in a series of carefully monitored clinical trials. The manufacturer usually conducts three phases of clinical trials. Each phase is designed to gather more information about the vaccine's safety and how well it works. These trials can take years to complete. During phase one, about 20 to 100 healthy adults get the vaccine. Researchers track how well the vaccine works, whether it's safe, what is the correct dose for disease protection, and what possible serious side effects may occur. In phase two, hundreds of volunteers participate. This is when experts learn more about the possible short-term side effects and how the volunteers' immune systems are responding. Phase three trials are the most informative with results from hundreds or even thousands of volunteers. In these trials, vaccinated volunteers are compared with volunteers who receive another vaccine or no vaccine. These results give researchers a better idea of how well the vaccine works and if there are possible side effects they should expect. The Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, along with the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, review all of the data the researchers have gathered throughout the trials and decide whether or not to license the vaccine. Once licensed, vaccines are made in batches called lots. Manufacturers test the lots to make sure the vaccines are safe, pure, and potent. The FDA reviews the safety and quality of each lot before it is released. The FDA inspects manufacturing facilities on a regular basis to ensure quality and safety. How a vaccine is added to the U.S. recommended immunization schedule. Once the FDA licenses a vaccine, CDC brings together the members of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, to review all of the research available on the licensed vaccine. The members of the ACIP include world-renowned vaccine and disease experts from groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Family Physicians, CDC, and other government agencies. These experts look at how well the vaccine works and whether it's safe when given to different age groups. They also weigh the seriousness of the disease the vaccine prevents and figure out how many children would get sick if they did not get vaccinated. The experts then decide if they should recommend that vaccine be added to the U.S. recommended immunization schedule. If the CDC approves the experts' recommendations, the vaccine officially becomes part of the schedule, and soon it will be available at your healthcare provider's office. How a vaccine's safety continues to be monitored. Once children start getting the vaccine, the FDA and CDC continue to watch for possible side effects. Reactions that happen after a vaccination get reported to the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, or VAERS. Anyone can submit a report to VAERS, including parents, caregivers, patients, doctors, and nurses. However, 
the reactions that are reported may or may not be caused by the vaccines. They may require further investigation. Researchers at FDA and CDC analyze the VAERS reports and look for any trends that may be happening. FDA and CDC also use other vaccine safety systems. The Vaccine Safety Data Link, or VSD, and the Post Licensure Rapid Immunization Safety Monitoring System, or PRISM, actively monitor new vaccines to obtain additional information about their safety. VSD has access to healthcare information for over 24 million people. PRISM can analyze healthcare information from over 190 million people. CDC also uses the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project, or CISA, to study vaccine safety. CISA is a collaboration between CDC and seven medical research centers. CISA vaccine safety experts conduct individual case reviews and clinical research studies about vaccine safety. Recommendations for using the vaccine may change if the vaccine's risks are found to be greater than its benefits. The end goal is always the same, to safely and effectively protect children, families, and communities against potentially serious diseases. For more information, please visit cdc.gov slash vaccine. Okay, so that is a lot of information, but hopefully, as you can see, there are several agencies watching out for side effects and safety concerns with vaccines. It's not just the CDC or just the FDA. They all work together to make sure that vaccine safety is their top priority. When we talk to parents, we can re reassure them that vaccines are safe and effective. Okay, let me just look at this chat box, make sure we're, we're good. Okay, I love how you guys are talking to each other and helping each other out and um, offering your perspective because that's what this training is all about to help each other to learn and learn from each other. So that's great. Okay, so another scenario, um, mom and dad both think that vaccines are good, but that babies get too many at one visit and that their immune systems are still too new for so many vaccines. So they plan to delay some vaccines and only get two at each visit. So what are some things that you can say to educate them and to reassure them? Now, I know we have a lot of medical assistants there. Maybe you have heard this, it'd be right before you're giving the shots. Um, so, you know, type in the chat, what are some things that you say to educate them and reassure them? Um, okay, so we can let them know that getting childhood vaccines are not an extra burden on their, the immune system, even for babies. Babies are exposed to hundreds of viruses and bacteria during normal activities like eating and playing. And I have a toddler right now. She puts everything in her mouth and climbs on everything and we go anywhere and she's touching everything. I'm sure she has been exposed to hundreds of viruses and bacteria. <laughs> um, and also, even though kids receive more vaccines today, um, like that chart that Wendy showed earlier, they're, they're receiving far fewer antigens overall compared to their parents and grandparents. And they're protected for, um, against more diseases now than I was and my grandparents, my parents were. So uh, we have a little video here for, from Dr. Offit and he explains it. So great. So let's go ahead and watch that. Hi, my name is Paul Offit. I'm talking to you today from the Vaccine Education Center here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. The most common question that we get asked here at the center is, do babies get too many vaccines? It's an understandable question. In the first few years of life, babies get vaccines to prevent 14 different infections. That can mean as many as 27 inoculations during that first few years of life. It can mean as many as six shots at one time. And I don't care how smart you are about viruses or immunology, it's hard to watch your baby go through that. So the question is, is it too many? Well, so let's take a step back. When babies are in the womb, they're in a sterile environment. When they enter the birth canal and the world, they're not. And very quickly, they have living on the surface of their body 
trillions of bacteria. I'm not just trying to sound like Carl Sagan here, literally trillions of bacteria. You actually have roughly 100 trillion bacteria on the surface of your body. That's more than you have cells in your body. Now, each bacterium, each single bacterium, has a, between 2,000 and 6,000 immunological components. Now, by immunological component, what I mean is the complex sugar that sits on the outside of the bacteria, so-called polysaccharide, or the proteins that, are, that make up the bacteria. Viruses also have proteins, and those are considered also immunological components. Now, if you add up um, all the immunological components that are con currently contained in vaccines, it adds up to about 160. So think about that, 160 immunological components, which consist of viral proteins, bacterial proteins, or bacterial polysaccharides, as compared to the trillions of bacteria, each bacterium of which contains 2,000 to 6,000 immunological components. So I think literally um, what you are exposed to in vaccines is a drop in the ocean compared to what you're exposed to in daily life. Um, frankly, I, I think a cut on your knee is a greater challenge to your immune system than, than our vaccines. I think the common cold, which can reproduce itself thousands of times in your body, is a greater challenge to your immune system than vaccines. So I think the short answer to the question, can babies tolerate um, so many vaccines given in the first few years of life, is yes. Because frankly, they encounter far more in their environment than they're ever going to encounter in vaccines. Thank you. Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions, Denise, you know, you're doing a great job answering them all, but feel free. We, um, we will move on to the next one and answer any questions as they come in. So Wendy, I'll let you go ahead and talk about autism. Maybe that seems to be a common topic that people bring up when talking about vaccines. Um, so it's a really great topic to talk about today. Yeah, I would say that that's probably the, the biggest concern that we hear out there about just um, regular childhood vaccines is that they cause autism. Um, so this, this will be really good um, that if you ever come across this um, this question, someone hesitating because of this, you'll be armed with the right information to share with them. Um, so the scenario is a mom of a 13 month old toddler is sharing in her mom's group that her baby is not the same as she was before her MMR shot. She's worried that the shot caused harm and wants to warn others about vaccines and autism. Um, so we're going to say that, uh, we're going to go over some resources that can help you, um, address those concerns. Um, so, so first off the bat is that autism usually becomes apparent around the same age that MMR is given. So there's no um, causality proven. Um, it's more of a, it just happens at the same time. Um, the developmentally kids are starting to um, do be more um, uh, social and, and they're just a, a lot more aware. So um, around that same time, the 12 months is when signs of autism are actually starting to kind of make themselves known. Um, we don't know exactly what causes autism, autism but it probably has multiple components, um, including genetics. And oftentimes immunizations are given at a time when babies are changing quickly. They learn to crawl, walk and talk and their personality grows. Um, sometimes it feels like the toddler uh, crawling on the table saying no to everything um, is unrecognizable. We are my, uh, I told you my son just turned one last week and uh, he had his first tiny little tantrum the other day. I was like, wait, no, it's too early. <laughs> kind of did one of those fling, fling yourself back things. And I was like, oh gosh, no. Um, but yeah, it just happens around this time. They're learning to be more independent and aware. So I think we also have another video for um, from Dr. Offit on this one. Hi, my name is Paul Offit. I'm talking to you today from the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I think probably one of the most common concerns parents have about vaccines is do they cause autism? Certainly very easy to find that contention on the internet and uh, in chat rooms, so it can be scary. And I think from the parent's standpoint, they argue this, look, my child was fine, they got a vaccine, now they've developed signs and symptoms of autism, could the vaccine have done it? 
Well, the good news is that's an answerable question. And it's really been in three different areas that this issue has been raised. One is the concern that the combination of measles, mumps, rubella, or MMR vaccine caused autism. The second is the notion that uh, there was an ethyl mercury containing preservative that was in a number of vaccines. Now it's only in some multi-dose of influenza vaccine called thimerosal. And then the third sort of concern is that children are just getting too many vaccines too soon, that that's somehow weakening or overwhelming or perturbing their immune system. Well, these are studyable questions. You can answer this question. So, for example, in the case of measles, mumps, and rubella, there now have been 18 studies done in seven different countries on three different continents involving hundreds of thousands of children who either did or didn't get the MMR vaccine, making sure that those two groups are otherwise similar with regard to their healthcare seeking behavior, their socioeconomic background, their medical background. And again and again and again, those studies all found the same thing that the MMR vaccine did not cause autism, and that's been true also for these other two concerns. The good news is I think most parents get this. I think most parents believe these studies because a recent study by the Autism Science Foundation found that about 85% of parents with, of children with autism now are comfortable that vaccines weren't the cause. Thank you. Um. I just wanted to point out, Cheryl, I saw your comment. Um, yes, the, um, the, the doctor who originally um, published that study um, has been stripped of his medical license uh, that autism or that vaccines cause autism. Um, there was absolutely no truth. His, his study was very, very flawed. Um, and yeah, he lost his medical license. So it's been proven time and time again, like Dr. Offit said, hundreds of thousands of kids have been studied to see if there is a link. And um, you can feel confident in saying that there is no link. And then now we also want to talk about uh, measles parties. And more recently, we've been hearing about uh, COVID-19 parties. Um, so a family you're working with just attended a chicken pox party so that their kids have a chance to get the disease and boost their immune system. They want to know if chicken pox and measles and now COVID-19 uh, parties are a good idea. Um, so here's some resources that are available to help um, hopefully help them make the right decision. <laughs> um, some information you can know is that infection, um, so infection usually does cause better immunity than vaccination. Um, sometimes it lasts a little bit longer, but we know that natural disease can have, can carry with it some very serious uh, consequences. Um, paralysis, permanent brain damage, uh, liver cirrhosis or cancer, deafness, blindness, pneumonia, um, and even death, you know, these um, these diseases are still around and can be very serious when somebody actually gets the, the active um, active infection as opposed to an immunization. And Dr. Our friend Dr. Offit is going to talk about this also. Hi, my name is Paul Offit. I'm talking to you today from the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. One question parents reasonably ask is, isn't natural infection better than immunization? Well, I mean, I'm a man in my 60s. I was a child in the 1950s. I had measles. When I had measles, I developed an antibody response that is probably threefold greater than what children will get if they get a vaccine. Um, but what I didn't have to suffer by, by being naturally infected was I didn't get pneumonia, which could have caused me to be hospitalized. I didn't get encephalitis or infection of the brain, and I didn't die. I mean, they, every year in the 1950s, everyone got measles by the time they were nine years of age. That meant that three to four million people every year would get measles. About 48,000 would be hospitalized with pneumonia or encephalitis, and 500 would die. Fortunately, I wasn't one of those people, but I could have been. So the better question isn't, is, is natural infection better than immunization? The better question is, is immunization good enough? Can immunization induce an immune response that's good enough to prevent and arguably eliminate these diseases? Well, we have the answer for measles. When we had a second dose measles vaccine recommendation in 1991, that meant that all children in this country were recommended to receive a measles vaccine when they were 12 to 15 months of age and again at four to six years of age. 
With that, we eliminated measles from the United States, eliminated it by the year 2000. The only reason that it's come back recently um, is that a critical number of parents have chosen not to vaccinate their children. So I think the, the good news about the measles vaccine is it induces an immune response that's good enough to have eliminated that virus from this country without asking children or having children uh, risk the, the, the severe and occasionally fatal uh, effects of a natural measles infection. Thank you. There's some great discussion going on in the, in the chat. That I really um, appreciate it. Um, it is interesting to think too about, yeah, if, if adults have not been exposed to it, they've not been exposed and not been vaccinated because they're in a kind of a weird age, uh, age range but between the two, um, they they could get very, very sick. Um, that's Grace uh, Grace's comment. Um, and also what I think is really interesting um, is that we, you know, we're we're protecting ourselves now, but that could lead to more protection in the future. So if you've never had chicken pox, um, you know, the likelihood that you will get shingles um, is reduced. Um, so I think that's that's one thing to to think about as well. But if you have had chicken pox, um, then you the likelihood that you could get shingles, especially if not vaccinated, um, is always going to be there. Um, so yeah, so that's very interesting. I, um, I'm glad that some people have not heard of these parties. So that is a, that's a good sign. <laughs> um, but it is something that we hear about. And um, I haven't heard as much about these COVID-19 parties um, as at the beginning of the pandemic when everyone was just like, oh, let's just get it and get it over with. Um, and then, you know, not realizing that they could get it again and again and again. Um, so uh, it's just, it's very interesting to see how it's all it's all playing out. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about um, finding reliable resources. It's really important that you know where you can find reliable resources and know which websites, apps, books, videos are from trusted sources. Um, this handout is available on our website and it lists all the different um, resources that are science-based, evidence-based, um, and places where you can go of things um, when you need to find information about vaccines. We watched a lot of videos from Dr. Offit today. And um, like Wendy said, he's from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and their website has so many different resources. As I said in the beginning of the training, all of the videos, handouts, links, information, all of it is available on our website and we'll be emailing it to you after the training is over. So you just go to the website, you can see the recording from today, as well as all of the things that we have talked about. It makes it really handy because if you are talking with a parent and you think, oh yeah, that one video where he explained it really well, um, you can just pull it right up and um, have them watch it. So we talked about Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, also, you can go to the CDC. These are two of the best sites to access valid and reliable information about vaccines. Um, you may run into another question we haven't talked about today, or if you think about something different, or you have a, a client or a patient ask a question, um, these are great places to go to find information. And also make sure that you ask your doctor if you have any specific questions, your medical provider. Um, this what, this um, handout was developed by our coalition members. So it's talking points and guidance to answer tough questions. Um, we, so we can definitely get this to you. I think it's listed on our website also. Um, the TAPI website right here is whyimmunize.org. And we have information for parents of young children and grade school aged and um, off to college and throughout the whole, your whole lifetime. We have lots of different information as well as um, printable handouts. You can order them from us and we'll send them to you. You can download them yourself and print them out. Um, there are just so many different resources on our website. Here are just some of them. Um, we can also help your organization develop any of these informational flyers. If you see something that you would like to put your logo on and hand out to your clients or your patients, um, 
like this one off to college. It's things that you need to, um, vaccines that you need before going to college. Um, there's the flu flyers, how to stop the spread of germs, how to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. So there are a lot of different ones. Um, Denise may be putting our website in the chat already. If your health insurance does not cover vaccines or um, you do not have health insurance, you can still get your children immunized against preventable diseases with no cost. It's a federally funded program called Vaccines for Children. So you'll wanna contact the county health department for our locations. And that is our training. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we love to give prizes. And so I do have an evaluation. Let me pull it up real quick and I will get it into the chat. Here it is. Um, so fill out our evaluation because um, you like your feedback helps us develop training, future trainings and um, helps us improve them and, and let us know what is helpful and what wasn't helpful. And um, it's a really great thing. So fill out the evaluation. I did put the link in the chat box and we would love to hear, hear from you. Um, if you have any last questions, I don't see any that have not been answered already. So um, everyone have a great day. Thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us. I hope that you learned something and you can always reach out to me um, lsmith at tappy.org if you have any additional questions. Um, if you have any coworkers or organizations you work with that would like to take this training, we do offer it um, every quarter. So our next training will be the first Thursday in September and then in December also. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Laura, I have, oh, we're still recording. Is it? <laughs>